Today, anger on the streets of Pittsburgh. The outrage after a jury reached their decision in less than four hours Friday, finding a former East Pittsburgh police officer not guilty of murder or manslaughter. Unfortunately, we have come to expect this kind of outcome all throughout the country. It is our duty to fight for our freedom! Don't shoot! The jury, nine white and three black, acquitted Michael Rosfeld, who is white for the 2018 shooting of Antoine Rose, a 17-year-old who is black and unarmed. The shooting caught on video shows Rose right there in the white shirt and his friend running from police. Their car, Rosfeld said, matched the description of a car involved in a shooting nearby and two guns were later found inside. Rosfeld fired three shots, hitting Rose in the back, the elbow and the face. His defense, it happened very quickly, he said in court. My intent was to end the threat that was made against me. He did his job and nothing to do with the color of anybody that he was arresting. After the verdict, Rosfeld's attorney's office was shot up. And today, a commitment to keep fighting and remembering an honor student and his son. I'm angry, but I'm not. Um, it hurts more than anything. Hello, family. This is African Esquire, and I'm here with another video. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the Antoine Rose case. Unfortunately, we're here once again, and I'm not going to pretend to be surprised. I'm not going to pretend to be shocked. Um, obviously, I'm, there's always outrage, but at this time and at this particular point in our history, we have to stop pretending to be shocked. And so what I'm talking about, if you haven't uh, seen the news already, there was a case with a 17-year-old young boy who was in a car with someone who was stopped by the police and he goes out the back door, runs away from the cop and the cop unleashes, I believe, three shots, killing him. Um, the thing that's not a surprise, obviously, is not the, just the fact that the cop felt like it was necessary to kill him just because he proposed some type of danger being a black child. The thing that's also not surprising is that once again, the system has found a cop not guilty of murder in spite of the fact that this child, who again was just a young black boy, despite of the fact that he was running away from a cop, in spite of the fact that he did not have a weapon on him, the system still found his murder justified and found the cop not guilty. Um, as I stated, I'm not surprised. And, you know, let's just get past that part. At the same time, this should still disturb us. I would hope that we're not becoming numb to these things. Um, I know that over time with social media, because of the pool of social media, we all get on online. And we all comment on different things that happen in our community. And when we see there's no justice, it becomes like a reinforced image that we're being replayed over and over again, that constantly shows us that the system does not value us. Now, really, the system's never valued us. We came here as slaves, uh, not came here, we were brought here as slaves. Uh, we were brought here as people who were supposed to work for other people and to have no rights of our own. So the systems never valued us. Um, so that's no surprise there either. But this, the issue is, how do we react to these things? How do we deal with these things? How do we take it that, you know, we have to understand at this point that, it's, that the American justice system has constantly shown us that as far as black children, black men, black women, that our lives are not worth protecting and that it is justified to kill someone who has black skin. That someone with black skin in this country and the United States automatically poses a threat, automatically is someone who should be seen as being criminal, automatically is someone who should not be seen as being innocent. This is something that just being black being of African descent, that automatically puts us in a category of being prey to a system of white supremacy. Now, as I said, 
from the beginning. It's not shocking. But we, we do have to start talking about is how do we talk about these things? How do we address these things? And, I, and I've talked about many police brutality cases on this channel. And um, even though I've said, you know, basically, you know, a lot of the same message surrounding them, I, I don't want to get to the point where I'm numb to, to the fact that these cops get off. It gets to the point where I don't have anything to say because there's always something new to take from these different situations. Now, I was reading an article article today in regard to Antoine Rose and I'm about to pull it up right now um, but basically it was an article from his father's standpoint um, the, it's from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette Gazette and it says father of Antoine Rose he felt bamboozled by the verdict it says as he watched the trial of Michael Rossville last week and that's the cop who shot and killed this young boy um, Antoine Rose Sr. prayed for a conviction, but expected an acquittal. He's a smart man. <laughs> the father of the late Antoine Rose II said in an interview Tuesday afternoon that before the trial started, he was confident in the prosecution, but by the end of the first day, he suspected that they weren't going as strong as they should have. He said, I felt I was bamboozled. Now, it says his comments come as a reaction to the acquittal of Rossfield, um, which included a say, statement from the NAACP that um, supported the work of the case of the prosecutor of Allegheny County District Attorney Stephen A. Zapala Jr., but warned of possible future protests. I'm going to stop right there for a second. So, you know, what the father said was very interesting. He felt like from the beginning that this is, was not a case that was set up to be won. And, you know, already, you know, you have to know that if your son, your daughter was shot by the police, it's already really going to be slanted in the police's favor. But for him to say that I went to trial, I was actually confident in the prosecution, but then I seen and the way that they prosecuted just from the first day, I basically felt like they weren't going to go as hard as they should have. And as you, if you can imagine, had it been someone else's child, had it been a white child, that, that prosecution would likely have been going a lot harder because society views white children as being innocent, although they don't view black children that same way. But you hear the father saying this, and it's important to note the prosecution is supposed to be the ones fighting for your family. It's, if, if they are prosecuting the person who murdered your son, that is their job. That is their mandate. They are supposed to be convicting the society who has seen this murder. They're supposed to be the conscience of society. They're supposed to bring, bring um, notice and attention to the fact that this young boy was basically sacrificed by this system and this should be appalling to all of us. That's what they're supposed to do, that's their job. But when the person who is tasked with the sole, sole job of actually being on your side, but more so fighting the case and fighting for your son's murder to have been have to have received some type of justice and that person may not have been going as hard if the, as they should have that's very telling it's very telling in that we should already know that this system again is not created to address us this system is not created to give us remedies whenever we are victims of police brutality instead the system was created to put a band-aid on these types of cases enough to keep you quiet because it, as you might have noticed there's a pattern with a lot of these police brutality cases and that you start off with having a lot of people angry and after a while, after things have settled down, then they'll start doing things. Then they'll release the video. Then they'll um, they'll actually dismiss the charges. After people have settled down and has slowly left their conscience, then you see them actually doing more things that actually would may have caused a, a completely different reaction had the people been more stirred up. And unfortunately, we operate in such a way that we're reactionary. And when you act, operate in a way that's reactionary, your enemy, your um, who studies you, you know, don't think that as far as the black community, how we react, how we 
do certain things that we don't have people studying us and we don't have the people who create this system who uphold this system studying our habits as far as what can we get away with how can we maintain our system of power with these people how do we do so and because we're so reactionary without building without actually putting institutions in place, without actually organizing, to have organizations that are going to continue to push the narrative after we no longer uh, are um, on social media, after we basically, we, we got our temporary band-aid, we have charges, so we think, okay, let's let's see what happens with the case. You know, there, there we don't, we don't build while, you know, we get the, um, the charge we instead basically walk away and we hope that a year or so down the road that they're going to do the right thing because they know that we're not building that we are so reactionary they have realized that there are certain ways to get around with this constant acquittal of officers who murder black people without actually doing anything fundamentally different so i'm saying that to point out that this reactionary structure is not built to actually bring change. Protesting when it happens and then forgetting about it until it's actually time to get a verdict and then you get the verdict and then by that time it's so it's too late. You know, you start protesting again. That's not building anything that's going to change the way that things are going. That's actually doing things that gives the system ways to maneuver around you, to maneuver around your emotions, and wait till you're no longer paying attention, and then to execute their agenda. So these are things to remember. Now, um, the other thing I want to point out is the um, NAACP. And I, the reason why is because in this particular video, uh, I really want us to listen to the voices of our ancestors who have been telling us over and over again, this is not a civil rights issue. These are not civil rights issues. These are human rights issues. The NAACP, their job and their operation is to ask the system that was built from our demise, that was built for our demise, that was built to keep us in subjugation. That, that's what the system was built for. You know, forget the fact that, oh, well, maybe we can change it. No, it was literally built to do what it's doing. And their way of doing things, and a lot of other civil rights groups, is to basically appeal to the system that has been built to kill people, built to oppress people, built to disenfranchise people who are African. That's how they've been built. That their job is to appeal to the system to change. And this is what the civil rights mentality does to us. Not saying that there aren't any uh, reasons to assert your civil rights in certain instances, but when you take a broader look at what's going on as human rights, and as I said, our ancestors have been telling us, I mean, from Malcolm to, to Marcus to so many people, these are not just civil rights issues. These are issues that go beyond the jurisdiction of the United States. These are human rights. And so until we make that shift, because protesting... You know, protesting when things happen, uh, getting mad, doing these rallies, and then coming out, and then you know, saying, "Well, you know, um, at least we got a a, a a charge. You know, at least we have an indictment. That's enough. Uh, that's the civil rights mentality. But if you're having a human rights mentality, then you have to look at what other options you're afforded. So, you know, I thought it was very telling that to them, to the NAACP, there are partial victories. Um, the boys did. Um, Antoine Rose, he's not coming back. And the man who killed him is walking free. Despite the fact that this man has had a history of wrongful conduct, police conduct, he gets to walk free after killing this young boy. And there, to them, there's a partial victory because, well, at least we got an indictment. At least he was charged. That, that, that's nonsensical. Because when you're thinking like that, that really allows the system to maneuver around you. Because we have to understand racism, the institution, does not end. It does not, it's not created to um, implode. It's created to evolve. And once they realize they can do little things just to get you to calm down, they're willing to do those concessions. They've done concessions 
over and over again. Voting Rights Act, that was a concession. The Civil Rights Act, that was a concession. The abolition of slavery, that was a concession. The system is okay with doing concessions. That's not, that shouldn't be enough to us. We have to look at the bigger picture. We have to look at what the end result is. The end result is way more important than these little small battles. You know, we're, to we're told to think that, oh, everything's going to change. We just have to keep struggling. And we have to take these small battles as victories. These small battles are not victories. The fact that the man was charged, if anything, that should be even more appalling because he was charged and there was a jury who, it was in their hands to decide whether or not this black boy was worth anything. And they came up with the verdict that he wasn't worth anything. Um, and because they decided that, this man gets to walk free. That's just an insult <laughs> to us, regardless of the fact. It, was a, it would have been an insult had they not charged the officer. And it would have been an insult had they charged him and let him go. And, and actually said he's actually not guilty for the things that he's accused of, in spite of the fact that we have this whole thing on camera. So it's all an insult. So let's read a little further. So um, he said this in this. Uh, oh, sorry. The article says uh, since Friday evening's verdict, demonstrators have demanded, among other things, the creation of a countywide civilian police board. Allegheny County Executive Rich Fitzgerald on Wednesday reiterated reiterated his support for county. Um, council officials' efforts to create such a board. Instead, he supported the work by area state legislators to promote regional police equity and accountability. So I'm going to stop right here. Yes, you know, there's, there's good that people are like, okay, we need to stop but depending on the same way that things happen. You know, maybe we should type a, try to have a countywide board. Here's the issue, and I'm from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is not even close. Allegheny County is not even close to being a county with a good black representation. So when they say county wide police review board, first of all, I understand that the vast majority of people over there are not um, black. There's a black community there, but it's very much been crippled by so much racism. I mean, I, I knew that growing up that I was in a racist city. I knew that I was in a place where um, th the power of the black community has been sucked dry. So this is not a system where black people are enfranchised. This is not a system. It's not a, a region where we are, you know, making strides. This isn't like, you know... Um, somewhere like, you know, the image of Atlanta, Georgia being this black Mecca. This is actually somewhere where uh, the black community has basically, it's really shrunk, first of all. And, and outside of that has been very much targeted by racism. Um, and it's manifested in various um, other types of aspects of society. Um, you know, this is not something that's going to be representing black people, is what I'm trying to say. So. While it's good that there that the thought came to people, we need something that's going to be our police review board. I would just question who, first of all, who made it countywide. Um, as, as I said, Allegheny County is not a um, county with a strong black uh, population or even an organized small black population. It's just not. Um, second, if this is the same place where the same county where they just allow this man to walk free. What makes you think that a police review board that is ran by the county is going to do anything different? What makes you think? Do you think that the people who are going to sit in this uh, this county board, or you think they're going to pick people from the black community? And more than likely, no, they would not. They would be probably having a lot of the same officials that would be inside of the other aspects of the system who also play roles inside of the oppression of black people, there would probably be that similar representation inside of this county-wide review board. So why am I saying this? Going back to human rights, we have to start looking at the right of self-determination. And the Federation of African Liberation, we have called for this um, inside of our, our um our goals and objectives, one of our goals and objectives is to have um, a black community um, ran 
a community organization to actually start controlling issues of police brutality um, as far as when it happens and also to start surveillancing the police. You know, these are things that we have called for. But the reason why we want to say black specifically is because we have to understand that with the right of self-determination, that when a system has consistently failed to do anything for you, when a system has consistently shown you that they're going to treat you a certain way, that we do have a right to say, okay, you are no longer representing us properly. You are no longer doing for us what you should be doing. And you don't show any sign of doing so in the future. There's been no bright light to this. There's been no, oh, you know, things are getting better. No, it's, it's, it's very consistent. The police getting off has been very consistent. And so at this point, we have to stop trying to do things through that system and we have to start thinking about the human rights aspects. So just to give you, you know, a little um background about you know the right to self-determination and this is from uh encyclopedia princeton nini means sis i've never seen this word before but basically it's princeton university um and i'm actually going to put a link to this inside of the description for this video but um just a quick introduction to that self-determination has two aspects internal and external Internal self-determination is the right of, of, of the people of a state to govern themselves without in, outside interference. Ex, external self-determination is the right of peoples to determine their own political status and to be free of alien domination, including formation of their own independent state. Um, so you have two different types of self-determination. One tends to be linked to having a territory, um, although there are a lot of people trying to work to have external um, self-determination, even though they don't have necessarily a t actual territory designated. The other one is to say that, well, we are in inside of this territory of the United States, but we do want the right to actually represent our own affairs. So there are two different aspects. Um, I, s I would say that either aspect could work for us and either aspect could actually do more for us. And, you know, I still have the stance that I've said in previous videos. I don't believe there's ever going to be a day in the United States of America where you can be black, walk around in the street, and you're going to be as safe as a white child. I just don't believe that's going to happen. Um, that being the case, <laughs> you know, um, we can create our own systems to actually have more control over things whenever they do happen in our communities. So when we're talking about police, we shouldn't be talking about countywide review boards. We should be talking about review boards by Africans in America who are going, who are separate from the system, not getting money from the system. That's that's very important because having a black face on a county or having on a police review board does not mean anything as far as justice. We should know because repeatedly throughout this whole police brutality movement, we've seen that sometimes it's been white faces who have been um, used by the system to to oppress us, and sometimes it's been black faces because white supremacy is not in need of having uh, white people to carry out their agenda to, to execute what they want to do. Ultimately, you can have a black face and they could be even more effective because people will be less inclined to think that they need to rebel because they see a black person who is the face of this. Um, so that's something that's just very important to remember that when it comes to the system of white supremacy, it, it doesn't matter who you know, is in the role, what matters is the system. So what we have to ask for is something outside of the system. We have to ask for something outside of the justice system, out, un, unconnected to police unions, unconnected to the, uh, the prison system, unconnected to any type of political system. We have to start thinking as an independent tribe, honestly. When you think about Native Americans, how certain things, when they happen, they go outside of the jurisdiction of the United States and are are um, handled by the tribes. They're handled by as tribal issues. They, whenever, um, for example, the the biggest example would probably be ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Relief Act. Whenever there's a child, a, a Native American child who's taken into foster care custody, that case is considered outside of the jurisdiction of the United States. Therefore, they have the right to oversee those, those custody determinations. And the reason is because historically, Native Americans have been targeted 
by the foster care system to have their children removed. So them seeing that we are targets of the foster care system, they organized and they said, you know what, we're going to get some legislation passed that's going to say that given the historical record that the United States has with our people, given the fact that we are historically disenfranchised people who have basically lost all of our land, been given scraps as land basically to live off of, on that basis, we're going to say that any time that one of our children goes into the foster system, you need to turn them over to us, that we have jurisdiction, which is a very strong statement. Now, when you think about the history of Native Americans and you think about the history of Africans in America or so-called African Americans, when you think about these two parallel histories, first of all, um, our, us being here as well as them being here has basically been almost as, well, let me take that back, us being brought here um, versus the start of co the, the colonization of America. Uh, we've been brought here from the beginning of the colonization of America, and this is also when um, Native Americans uh, previous to us were um, being being basically um, at war with the United States because they wanted their land. So when you look at these two parallel histories, when you look at the history of slavery versus genocide by actual um, wars, genocide by slavery, and you look at the parallel treatments that we have received, there's not a good argument that anyone can make that Native Americans should only have these rights of self-determination and that blacks in America, we should not have these same rights. The only thing that you can possibly say is that we're not organized, which is true. Um, in particular, when you look at the way that we identify ourselves, there's some people who, you know, if you, for example, one of the things that makes the Native American claim so strong is that they have a claim saying that we have a culture. We have an indigenous culture. We have a culture that we have to preserve and that we have to pass on to our children and that the United States has shown that they do not respect. Um, this togetherness, this culture is something that we will unite over. Whereas with us, we have so many people in so many different directions. Some people who are African in America, they don't want to uh, associate with their African culture. They think that there's this idea of an American culture that um, is separate and that they want to conform to, which really, you know, it tends to be a Europeanized, Europeanized notion of American culture. There are some who don't feel that way, who do identify some differences, um, but who also want to kind of fall in the middle. You know, they don't want to identify either or. And then there's some who are completely pro-African and who want to completely identify with our culture that has been stolen from us. You know, we're all over the place. Um, these different aspects of us obviously give us less of an argument to make because when you have some people saying, this is our home, this is our place, this is our flag, we love America. You have other people saying, you know, no, yes, yes, this is our home. Yes, we built this place. But yes, we are distinct because we are of African descent. You have different views and different people that have different takes. And then, of course, you have, um, you know, Black Americans who say we are the uh, Native Americans, you know. Um, you know, we're, we're all over the place. So when you have, or we are um, the original Hebrews, you know, we have so many different sects. We have so many different ideologies. Um, when we're all over the place, it does weaken our argument, I think. So this is why we have to start thinking about what we want. We have to start thinking about who we are. We have to start identifying who we are. We have to start identifying how are we going to set ourselves aside from other groups in America? How are we going to set ourselves aside? How are we going to say that we're distinguished? You know, and saying that being here, being black, we've been under attack over and over again. How do we identify a, a common culture that we've descended from? And different people have tried different ways to do that. But, you know, going forward, I, I think obviously I know my stance and that my stance is that um, we are, again, an African people. Um, and when you look at the, um, for example, historically, the, the African culture that has been passed down to us from being on, even when we were on plantations, so much of that still exists to this day, but it's still under attack. 
So my, you know, stance is that we are an African people, that we do have, it, you might not know African culture, but when you actually look at the comparison between African and European culture, you realize that we carry a lot more of that than we think we do. Obviously, we've been affected. Obviously, a lot of it has been diluted from being brainwashed inside of this country. But because of the resilience of African culture, we still do carry that with us. Um, not only that, you know, my stance is that whenever you have other Africans come to the United States, whether they be from the Caribbean, whether they be from Africa, wherever, they too are subjected to the same things that we are subjected to. Um, and because of that, this is something that unites all of us. So I'm saying that to say that all of us together, we are under attack. You know, um, Amadou Diallo, I believe his name, um, that was a man from Africa. And he doesn't have the same history of slavery as other people do, yet he was still seen as prey. He was still seen as someone who needed to be taken out. Um, the more and more you go into certain places in the United States, the more you kind of realize that we've all kind of just basically all been lumped into this category of being dehumanized, the, uh, this category of not having rights, especially, you know, so... Um, when you're in like areas like, I would say, places like New York, um, when you look at places like um, like Florida, where they have a lot of Haitian populations, these di different places, you'll, you'll start seeing that the treatment of these people is not contingent on how you got here. It's not contingent on what you're, um, you know, who, how long you've been here. It just, it's just not contingent on that. When they see black skin, that automatically makes you a prey. That automatically makes you a target. So, you know, again, when we're talking about separation, when we're talking about the fact that we have to join with something and we have to agree with something and identify as something, the strongest argument to me is that we have to make an argument that us who are with black skin of African descent, that we are not going to be treated right in the system. We are not going to be having our lives upheld in this system and we're going to be subjected to racism period it, it, people when they see a black your black skin they're not saying hmm looks like you're from hmm, cameroon no they see your black skin and your black skin makes you a target so that being the case we have to find what about our black skin can unite us culturally to where we can have a strong self-determination argument so you know that i think that's all i'm going to cover from the article um let me double check one second um, well, yeah, let me go back to just a comment from the NAACP. So the Pennsylvania Conference of the National Association of the, for the Advancement of Colored People expressed in a new release statement discussed for the loss of the 17-year-old unarmed black man in East Pittsburgh, who was shot June 19, 2018. And they added, again, they applied the uh, Allegheny County a district attorney for filing charges against the former East Pittsburgh officer, which is, uh, to me, I don't understand applauding that because that's their job. <laughs> you know, your, the job is that if someone is killed and there's no possible justifiable reason, you know, it couldn't have been self-defense because he's running away, you know, I mean, couldn't have been a threat because, again, he was running away. <laughs> um, you know, the the job of the prosecutor is to do those charges that's what they're supposed to do um so it's said that we have to feel like we're getting something from um when the system does what it's supposed to do for black people but again that's the civil rights mentality um let's see okay this is what i want to hit so rose was not willing rose senior the father he was not willing to concede that even the filing of the charges against Mr. Rossfield was a step forward for the justice system. This is what I really want to hit. He said, I really think they brought him the trial because of the impact of the closing down of the city streets, the closing down of the parkway. It was much cheaper to bring him to trial and let him win and shut down, then to shut down the city and show that the wrong that's going on. And this is again what we have to keep in mind. In closing, when we're, when we're talking about 
what we need to think of as a people. You know, they are willing to do things to keep you quiet. They're willing to do things to pass time. They're willing to do these symbolic gestures. And we have to stop caring about these symbolic gestures. I mean, it's it, it really gets to me. I, I see still on social media so much symbolism people get so excited about. They're like, oh, so-and-so was the first person to win this Oscar. Or, oh, so-and-so is the first um, black woman. See, these are symbolic gestures. I mean, if you don't have power, who cares? I don't care. <laughs> like, you know, you'll never hear me say, you know, I'm the first black woman this. You'll never hear me say that because I don't care that these are symbolic things. I know that if I get something, that I'm the exception, not the rule. Um, so saying, well, okay, we have charges in this case, therefore, you know, that that's that's progress. No, that, that's symbolism. The progress will begin when we actually, number one, before, you know, we get to this point where we actually have control, community control to the point where these cops will be held accountable for any types of time that they do step out of bounds, because they will. Like I said, we'll, I don't believe we'll ever be safe as long as the system is set up to be as it is, because we have to understand that the police are doing what they're supposed to do. You know, police um, brutality is not going to go away when you have a capitalistic country, because capitalism is built on the main maintenance of a social system where the underclass, who has always been black since um, the rating of Africa for people and resources that the underclass always be made to maintain, to stay in that position of uh, sub subjugation sub subjugation and the police are really just the enforcers of ensuring that that happens you know if you start doing things that threaten the ruling class that's when you'll see the police come out that's when you'll see the cops come in to put us back into place um, a lot of times, you know, they, they don't care if we just stay insulated in our communities and wreak havoc on ourselves. But whenever we are a risk to the overall society, that's when, we're, when they're actually going to be um, unleashed to the fullest extent. That's when you'll see the National Guard come in. That's when you'll see the police tanks, uh, the, the army tanks come in, you know, like they did in Ferguson. I believe something like that happened in Baltimore also. Um, so again, in closing, you know, let's just remember that we have to think differently. You know, I, I, it's the saddest thing to me where we're still talking the same stuff. We, we can't keep talking civil rights. It is 2019 and we're still talking civil rights. And Malcolm was telling us back in the 1960s that this is not the, you know, and forget, I mean, not forget Malcolm, but even not just Malcolm, you know, the nation of Islam, like so many people have been telling us. This is not the way that we're going to get anything. When you're always begging and asking a system that was built for your demise, please recognize me, please give me what I'm supposed to get. That's not that's not built for you to actually be protected. That's built for you to keep asking. And they might give it to you just to keep you be quiet. But they're not going to give it to you because they feel pressure from you being empowered because you have not taken the time to build power. You have not taken the time to build institutions, organizations. I mean, I know I say this over and over again, but we have to have organizations. We have to have organizations specifically designated to the right of self-determination of African people. And we have many, but we need to give them strength. We need to give them numbers. And we need to find ways to support them. Because these are the ones that stand the greatest chance of giving you any type of remedy. Organizations that are built to keep begging, built to keep talking to the power structure and saying, please, please recognize us. Please give us something. These are not the organizations that are built to change anything. I mean, these just think about the fact about how long have we been dealing with these things. Think about how long we've been dealing with these things as opposed to other communities who have already surpassed us, who were asking for bigger things. You know, think about, you know, the, I keep using, you know, Zionism as an example, but think about the state of Israel how they were actually able to <laughs> to completely overrun a territory where people were living and take control of that territory and claim it as their own and actually have a state 
put in place in spite of the fact that originally a lot of people in the world, including in the West, were actually against it. Think about how quickly they were able to achieve that. It's a major thing. They were actually able to build a whole nation in spite of the fact that they're surrounded by Arab countries who said, you can't do this here, in spite of the fact that originally the even the United States was not in support of Zionism. Um, many of the European countries were not in support of Zionism originally. Think about how quickly they were able to turn that narrative around and get control and power. Now think about how quickly that happened. And then here we are, you know, been here 400 plus years, still asking, please stop killing us. <laughs> it's sad, you know. And we have to start understanding the reason they were able to do that is because of the level of organization. It's not because of the love, the um, the number of people in a protest. You know, it's great that a lot of people came out to support Antoine Rose. My understanding is about a thousand, a thousand people, um, young students. But that's not organizing. Organizing is having organizations. If you want to turn a narrative around, we have to organize, not in a reactionary way but in a side of a proactive way, we have to organize offensively and not just defensively. That's basically all I have for you guys. Um, you know, if you are looking for organizations, uh, the Federation of African Liberation, we are very much an organization that seeks to have black community control of these issues. And it should not go to the jurisdiction of your county, that's probably white, um, majority white anyways, it should go to the jurisdiction of the people who are most oppressed and not be paid for by the state, not be uh, not be something that is, or when I say paid for by the state, not people who are directly paid for by the state. It's different having a grant program or something like that, but when you have people who are directly paid for um, getting their check from the attorney general or whatever, that, that's a system that we need to get outside of. So these are all things for us to talk about and all things for us to talk about in organizations. I don't talk about a lot on this channel because some of them we can't talk about on YouTube. We can't talk about on Facebook. We have to talk about them in our organizations. So if you're seeking to do something differently, you know, you want to get off YouTube, Federation of African Liberation. We are an organization. There are so many other organizations that work towards these issues. Um, let's build if you start your own organization, if you can't find what you that you do like, let's build and let's actually build something concrete. That's all I have for you guys. And I will see you on another video.